Okay, we'll start with the Navkar Mantra. Om Namo Arihantanam Om Namo Sitanam Om Namo Ayadiyanam Om Namo Ajayanam Namo Lue Savasahunam Eso Panchanamo Karo Sava Pava Panasano Mangalalancha Save Sim Paramam Have Mangalam Paramam Have Mangalam Thank you everybody for joining this week. Thank you, Bhavan, for taking last week. Um, my coworker and I were talking the other day about a discussion he had with his daughter's teacher. The teacher said that his daughter could read just fine, great reader, but she wasn't thinking about the words she was reading. That is, she didn't try to understand the ideas that the words were meant to convey. And we both really laughed at that story because we read legal documents every day. So that happens to us every day. And I think most people have that experience too. Most people, uh, you know, you read something and then a little bit later on you realize you haven't been paying attention to what you're reading. And then you have to go back and reread the last couple of paragraphs. Um, the problem is, is that most people live their lives like that. Only there's no opportunity to go back and live that portion of your life over again like you would go back and reread those paragraphs. We've all had that experience of not being present when you're with your family or not being present at your job, not being fully present when you're eating or not being fully present when you're driving a car. So the thing I'd like for you to take away from the discussion today is that the quality of your attention determines the quality of your life. So I'll repeat that. The quality of your attention determines the quality of your life. The better you're able to pay attention to your experiences, the better your life will be. So today we'll be discussing how to increase that quality of attention. So number one, of course, is meditate. I've already talked your ears off about meditating, so if you hadn't tried it yet, me telling you more about how meditating is great is not going to make you try it. Has anybody started meditating? Okay, no problem. Uh, this is the number one thing you can do to increase the quality of your attention, which increases the quality of your life. The number uh, two and three things are exercise and sleep. Just like meditation, I'm not going to spend too much time here because if you hadn't started exercising and sleeping right already, me telling you that it will increase the quality of your attention is not going to do it for you. It's not going to move the needle for you. So we'll be mainly talking about work stuff, uh, which you may not know. So we've all had this experience. We're in a meeting and we're not paying attention. It might be a 50 plus person meeting. It's a all hands meeting. And there's three people up there that are not from our department. And we have no, it's, it's really not applicable to us to be paying attention during the meeting. So we do different things. One way to pay attention, to increase the, to practice increasing the quality of your attention is to think about a question to ask during the meeting. And it, and it keeps you engaged in what they're saying. And if they answer that question while they're talking, you have to, on the fly, think about another question, just one question. It doesn't have, you know, a thoughtful question. Um, uh, it's not just to make you look good in front of everybody, although that's nice. It's not just to make you look smart. It's a way to keep yourself engaged in the, the conversation that's happening. Another way is to make lists. So... There are two types of people in the world, people who make lists and unsuccessful people. A list will help you uh, write out your priorities. And this is important too, because you have your list of things to do, and then a separate list is your priorities. And then based on your priorities is how you order your list of things to do, right? And so the thing that is great about it is once you've determined everything, and for me, every day, I do it in the morning every day, right? And so once I determine that, once I'm working at, the, at that top thing, 
I'm not worried about the other distractions or the other things on my list. First, I wrote it down, so I'm going to get to it. And second, I know this is what I should be working on now. And that, I think, is something that people don't have a lot of. We're always wondering, is my time being best spent doing what I'm doing now? Or should I be doing something else? So if you don't have to worry about that, you won't get distracted and you can concentrate on doing that thing fully. Limit distractions, we've talked about that a bunch. I think we've had a couple classes on how to handle the phone. Um, maintain a schedule. This is a good one that works for me. I have a routine that I do every morning based on my priorities. So my priorities are keeping contact with people, especially my clients, and try to get new clients, right? So my routine in the morning is I turn on my computer and I uh, scan my email, first of all, to see if there are any uh, urgent items that need addressing. Next, I go to LinkedIn and I do my 10 to 15 minutes on LinkedIn. Next, I add one item to my uh, contact list every day. Sometimes I don't have phone numbers for people or addresses for people. I make sure that one entry is filled out every day. And so these are all my daily tasks that I perform. And as I'm realizing the power of this routine, I add more and add more uh, because I'm hacking my own brain to make it do what I want, right? And so my routine started off from like 15 minutes in the morning. Now it's an hour. And if I'm, I'm thinking about adding stuff to make it an hour and a half. Now that's not wasted time. That's me doing the things I need to do to be successful. So if you have a routine and then you can train yourself to add to that routine little by little. Practice attentive listening. So uh, there are different types of listening. And we do, I'll, I'll call one, the first one, cocktail party listening. Cocktail party listening is like, while the other person is talking, you're really just thinking about what you want to say next, right? You're really like looking for an opportunity to say it based on the discussion that's happening. Because it's like seven people standing around in a circle, you know, that's one kind of listening. That's the bad kind of listening. So practice the good kind of listening, which is you're not really worried about keeping the conversation going. You're not really worried about, you're just worried about the other person. You're worried about what they're telling you. You're looking at the expressions on their face. And if they stop talking because it's time for you to start talking, you realize you're practicing good listening when you have nothing to say because you're just thinking about them. Uh, thank you to everybody to just joined. We're talking about the quality of your attention today and how to increase the quality of your attention because the quality of your attention determines the quality of your life. And I just, I just had an experience this morning where I'm having a good interaction with one of my daughters and I was really present and I wanted to make sure I was there to experience it fully. I mean, I could have been worrying about today. I could have been worrying about what I was going to say today because it was the morning, but I didn't. I just concentrated on that one experience because I have plenty of bad interactions, right? So I wanted to enjoy this good interaction with we're having. And I really enjoyed that. I think that if we can do that with the good and the bad things, we will increase the quality of our life and we won't walk through life distracted, you know, in a fog, worrying too much about the future, worrying too much about the past. So we talked about listening without interrupting. Okay. So Can question, I ask a question? Yeah, questions about any of that. Yeah, so uh, what about for people who have uh, short attention span disorder or something? Would something like this work? Sure, absolutely. Um, if you have a short attention span, I'm not sure about the medical diagnosis of all of these things, but certainly meditating will help. Certainly exercise and sleep will help. Those are the number one, two, and three things we talked about but I've already talked to you about them enough and you already know the benefits of exercising and sleep. So we kind of glossed over those. Um, but certainly there are ways to increase your attention span. And if you devote time to it, then you will have a better attention span. And my promise to you is that your life will be better because you're able to pay attention to more so to the things that are happening around you. Um, so a recent, uh, a 2013 study said that the amount of focused attention somebody can provide, somebody can, um, the average amount of focused attention a person can have has decreased since 
2000. In 2000, it was 13 seconds. In 2013, it was eight seconds. Okay, this is true focused attention. So when we talk about uh, a little bit not focused, just general attention, that average is on the order of 10, a little bit higher than 10 minutes. Okay, so you should be able to, with practice, you should be able to get truly focused for more than eight seconds, okay? And that includes right now. You know, I see some of you, some of you are looking here, some of you are looking there, some of you are, you know, and, and that doesn't mean you're not paying attention, but I'm just telling you that now is an opportunity too for you to practice paying attention. Uh, other questions or comments? Thank you to everybody who just joined. We're talking about how to increase the quality of our attention, which will increase the quality of our life. Yeah, I think uh, going back to meditation, one of the big benefits of meditation is your attention, right? When you start off and you just focus on your breath, which seems like the easiest thing to do in the world, but you know, 12 seconds later, you already forget to focus on your breath breath it, absolutely uh, reminds you that if you can't build the habit of, uh, of focusing on the small things uh, as a foundation then it's hard to do the more important things on top of that sure absolutely you you hit the nail on the head because they are the building blocks of a large attention span so one interesting way is to just read more uh, this will harness your ability to concentrate because you have to remember what you read in the previous paragraph to apply it to this paragraph. You have to remember the characters. You have to remember what's going on in the story. And those memories will be used. Uh, you'll be thinking about those things as you're reading the current paragraph in addition to trying to understand the concepts that are being presented in the current paragraph, reading is a great way to increase your attention span. Here's another thing to do. A lot of us track our time for work. We have to log the minutes we spend on a project or on a client matter or something like that. But we don't do it at home, right? If this is such a great technique that our work is demanding us to do it, well, why don't you do that at home? That is, start writing down where all your time goes. Remember, the number one thing to do if you're trying to lose weight is to just write down everything you eat. First, you'll be surprised at how much it is. Second, it'll make you think twice about eating something if you have to write it down later and you have to face the consequences of your future self saying, oh, I ate that bag of chips, right? And then you'll feel bad about it later. That's the point. That is the whole point is to bring your attention to the present moment. So write down what you do in your free time. You'll be surprised at how much time you're wasting, how much time you're not spending with your family, how much time you're not attending to the goals you say you have because of the excuses you make like, I'm tired, or I just got finished work, I'm trying to relax, or I just did this, I'm trying to do this. If you track your free time, I guarantee you'll be surprised. You'll be more surprised than if you track what you ate every day. And in addition to that, identify during the day, what tracking your free time will do is it will help you identify when you're productive. Okay, there is such a thing as morning people. There is such a thing as night people. You have to figure out which one you are. If you don't know which one you are, you're going to have trouble structuring your day. Once you determine which one you are, use put your hard tasks. If you're a morning person, put your hard tasks in the morning and put your tedious tags like uh, data entry or time entry or responding to, you know, um, quick emails. Put that at the end when you're mentally going to be tired. And that way you will arrange your life according to your productivity schedule and you'll best use that attention. You'll best use your attention. You know, so a lot of times some people find um, it, it gets hard to get back in the flow after lunch, right? Because lunch is a really long break. So you can start schedule things for after lunch that'll ease you back in like, oh, that's when I use this, this time to check these emails 
but that's when I use this time to get back to these people. And so that way you'll structure your day pretty well. So questions about that? Similar, I am, uh, I'm thinking of some sort of barriers to paying attention. And I think what, what you had mentioned about is, you know, uh, like how to improve. And I, I think uh, it's, I 100% I, I agree, but I'm just thinking of like, you know, usually what are the things that like food and uh, future events or past events are the one that's keeping us away from paying attention in the, in the present time. Mm -hmm. And obviously, like you said, I mean, uh, meditation is one of the way reading, listening, but I, I think it can be achieved by by practicing those who i mean you know there are you know there are people called satavadani they actually kind of blank their memory kind of right before they they do that and then people will ask them 100 questions in a row and they will remember or answer them in that same order uh i think they have the same capabilities as we do we just have used our memory for other purposes uh is the way i'm thinking about it versus you know cleaning that memory for for what we really want to do in present. Uh, I think it's always, the way I'm thinking is past and present always occupies our attention in present. Right, exactly. And the thing to realize when we're talking about the past and present and how to not, the past and the future, and how to not let them affect your present, is you have to understand that it is a total waste to think about the past um, in most contexts because you can't change it, right? It's easy to say that you can't change the past, but it's hard to believe it. You have to do the work to understand that there's no use in thinking about these type of things. There are use in thinking about decisions that you made or what you're going to change going forward. And that's why I said in some contexts. But most of the time we ruminate. We ruminate about the bad decisions we made and there's no point of it. And with the future, there's, it's also we have to come to the realization that there's only a certain amount that we can control. And basically what we're doing is reacting to events unfolding before us, right? And we can't necessarily control everything. So you're absolutely right. Um, these things are wasting precious attention that we have to focus on the present. Yeah, Jimmy, what on attention what I hear between the lines of it and some of the examples you were giving to me come back to habits and a system to help you stay uh, stay in attention I love when you said you you update one contact or one contact entry a day and what I found important or helpful rather is to, to build these habits is to have that tiny what's the smallest stupidest habit that you can maintain every day that so that you won't fail right um, right and you know I'm, a, I'm a, from exercise I'm a runner yeah right and I've done longer races but uh, when it started it was not even I'm gonna run three miles a day I'm gonna run one miles a day it's I'm gonna put my shoes on once a day yeah right? or I'm gonna do one push-up a day because it's hard, especially if you're driven and you become successful and you have lofty goals. It, it's hard or it's easy to say, well, if I can't run five miles today, then I'm going to sit on the couch and watch football or do something else because I can't meet my goal. Whereas if you just put your shoes on or if you go out for a 10-minute walk, you did something. And you know most people would rather dream about running five miles and do zero <laughs> in reality, then take that 10, 15 minute walk and at least make progress towards that goal. And they build in that habit that, okay, I didn't have that 30 minutes to meditate today, but you know, I woke up in the morning and I said, no car mantra and, you know, check off for the day. I built the habit and I'll do uh, try again tomorrow. That's so great. And that goes along with um, what we teach our kids too, because we have to not only 
practice these things, we have to tell our kids how to practice these things, right? So believe it or not, um, this setting priorities thing is, I think, uh, invaluable for kids. My daughter is seven, and she's been understanding this for a while, that I have my priorities, and I do it a lot of, a lot of it by repetition, you know, What's your priorities? And we go through the list each time. The list never changes. You know, it's number one, your health and safety. Number two, your family. Number three, your schoolwork. Number four, your friends. Number, you know, the list, it's like seven or eight things long and it never changes. So whenever they don't know what to do next or which decision to make or how to spend their free time, um, we can go through the list. We say, well, what are your priorities and where does this fit? Uh, I I think kids are really receptive to that. And then they understand better when you say, no, we can't do that. It's They say, why? And you, it's usually just because I said so, right? Well, they understand it. If like, no, my priorities today are this, this, and this. And just like we talked about your priorities, this is what I'm trying to get done today. And so that eases the pain of us not being able to do everything with the kids all at once. Um, at, for... For our kids, too, we can teach them about avoiding context switching. They're actually better at unitasking than we are. We feel like we can multitask all the time. You can't multitask. If you say, no, no, Thimmer, I, I know how to multitask. In fact, you're probably worse at multitasking uh, than most people. Okay, so uh, having the list of things to do helps you not multitask. It helps you not get distracted. Do not think you can multitask. That is a myth. Um, Breaking up tasks into smaller goals, you hit the nail on the head perfectly, Shetu. Kids can understand that because things seem so daunting because everything is hard before it's easy and our kids don't know how to do anything. And so everything is hard all the time. So they get really frustrated, especially if they're good at something. Lord help you if your kid is good at something because then they'll only want to do that and when other things are not that easy, they're the normal amount of hardness, they will give up completely uh, because they feel like they should be good at it just like they're good at something. So breaking up the tasks into smaller goals is definitely what we should teach our children. Um, so questions about that, questions about anything we talked or comments about anything we talked about so far, especially about if you have some tricks about teaching your kids about paying attention then I want to know. I have one trick about being attentive to find out how attentive I am. So, you know, anytime I catch myself talking to kids, like, you know, especially Jeremy and Eric after their school, they're very eager to say something. And, you know, if I can, sometimes I'm able to pay attention and sometimes the things are very small and silly, you know, I mean, that's, that's what they do. But I can, I, can, I can figure out my quality of attention based on how I'm able to engage and connect with them during that time, which is not important for me, but it's important for them. Uh, it means, to me, it's my ability to stay present, even though I have, like, you know, it's the middle of the work time or something like that. But that's to me, is the, the ability to, to pay attention and, and actually remember that later on, and have a conversation on, on it longer is the way I think about it. Sometimes I just forget about it because I didn't pay attention. So that's just one trick that I know of. Oh, right. That's great. I haven't ever thought about that. Using um, our children as a way to measure the way we pay attention to ourselves. Because, frankly, um, my two daughters are talking all day. Uh, literally all day. Like, from the time they get up, um, they're telling me about every thought that enters their head. And so if I can pay attention, then I will remember every thought that enters their head. Other questions and comments? One of the items that we practice, uh, try to practice here, is you cannot call somebody from downstairs to upstairs. <laughs> <laughs> okay? As if they pass on the message and then they think it's work is done or something, including ourselves, you know. So one of the things we try to practice is go in front of the person and call their name and don't start talking until they look at you in their eyes, right? So at least one way they know that at least they are, you're trying to get their attention, you got their attention. And the second piece is once you're done with telling them, 
try to ask them repeat that thing what you understand it's, it's sometimes it's hard when you're doing a lot of things at the same time but sometimes it's really easy you 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 do these things you have to you can take more steps you count towards your daily step counts uh, and talk to them in person uh, you know what they are doing if they are really busy something then you may actually divert that discussion with somebody else um, rather than I'm in the kitchen shouting and s- telling somebody to do something simple as close the blinds uh, but no go there look at them talk to them and it takes a little more time but I think it, it does help a longer run that they understand that okay just by saying something doesn't mean that you have relayed the, relayed the message you know that's great. It's it, that's great. It's like you're <clears throat> you're engaging with your kid. Obviously, your kids obviously as people more than we normally would. If if we're yelling at them to close the blinds, we're engaging with them as a robot, right? But we're engaging with them when we engage with them as people. We're we're saying if I come up to talk to them and they're doing their homework, and I'm like, oh, I don't want to interrupt doing your homework to have the blinds be closed. So that's really amazing. I I really think. Um, that's going to be very helpful. Uh, you know, one time um, when my first daughter daughter just started talking, um, my wife had my wife and I had to figure out a new kind of way to communicate. Because before, when there's no kids, if she was talking, I was paying attention because there's nobody else. So obviously, she's talking to me. Now there's two other candidates she could be talking to. Now, when it started, she would be talking and expecting me to pay attention. But I wasn't because I thought maybe she would be talking to our daughter or something. So she had to learn like, oh, I got to say your name to get your attention. So I know you're talking to me. So as we as our family grows, we're going to have to learn different styles of communication. Do any of you have zones? I don't know if if there's a better word. I'm, I'm thinking from a work standpoint, whether it's a physical space or a time window that from work from eight to five, you're in your work zone. And now that I'm working from home through uh, the pandemic, right? I have a, a room that made into made into an office. And when I'm in that room, I'm in work mode. When I'm out of that room, I'm in home mode. Um, and that seems to work effectively for me from a professional standpoint to flip on and off. Uh, and, and focus on what I need to in those time zones and physical spaces. Um, I don't have that kind of structure in the personal life or with family time. And I'm curious if any of you do have that and what you found that works and may not work. Everyone on mute. <laughs> yeah, I um, don't have that, uh, especially with the pandemic. Um, being home means you're available to do anything and everything throughout the day. So the minute, like as you were saying, if they see you with a headset or to push them away, then they know I'm working. Otherwise, they will come approach me, and I also will approach them if needed. So. Right. It becomes common then, yeah. Maybe we can teach our kids about this zone idea, like if they're at their workstation, then we're not going to come bother them about non-school stuff, and they can reciprocate with us. If they're at, if they're on the living room, if they're on the in the living room on the couch then we can have a casual conversation or we can do something like that. Um, So maybe we can have a zone based on where people are rather than what time it is because we're all home all the time now. I know a lot of people do or have tried like at the dinner table, at the breakfast table. That's a a focused family time or a no device or no, no screen time. And I'm, just trying to extend that idea to see if it applies uh, outside of the table. Yeah, I mean, it certainly could, right? So we can divide up our time with um, uh, certainly people have um, family game nights or 
we can divide up our time um, according to what we have to get done, you know. So if it's family cooking time or if it's family reading time, I like that one. I like family reading time a lot where if we're all on different seats on the couch but we're not talking to each other, um, I think that that would be a great idea. Um, yeah, that's, that's really interesting to divide up our time at home into different zones. I like that idea. Personally, I think that's, this is the biggest challenge that I think a lot of us are facing right now. I call it uh, 24 seven parenting and 24 uh, seven uh, work. That's exactly what it's coming down to. And uh, if my wife will hear it, she, she will disagree with me on the parenting part that I do. But <laughs> the thing is, you know, I'm, I'm at work and, and Nereikus kind of has a time and he'll come over and say, you know, say something to me. And then uh, I'm at the, the lunch table sometime and the phone will ring and then I'm, I'm tempted to see it. Uh, having meetings at 6 p.m. in the evening or, you know, answering emails even on weekends and things like that. It's, I think, towards the later part of the pen. I mean, you know, after the last few months, I've caught myself in, in that dilemma and, and trying to get out of it. And I think if we can figure something out like the zoning type or uh, whichever the best way it is, but it is it is definitely taking a toll on personal uh, because you're, you're not satisfied anywhere. You feel like, uh, you know, you're not satisfied in the personal or professional because you're jumping between two all the time. And you never know if you had put enough time or not uh, in either aspect. So I, I definitely think we can use some help there. Don't have a, don't have an answer. I do not have the answer though. Okay, it's something for us to think about this week. Certainly, um, it's something that I will think about, and um, we'll bring. Um, I'll make sure to bring it up next week. And uh, speaking of that, we do have some items from last week that we need to take care of. I understand there were some questions or some follow up things that needed to happen. So I'll turn it over to Bhavan to discuss those items. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, yeah, last week, just to summarize, some of you all went on there. So uh, we talk about the lunar cycle compared to the sun cycle. So, um, you know, for most of the religious purpose, we all follow uh, the lunar cycle, which is consists of uh, from new moon to uh, full moon and then from full moon to new moon so about 28 days and compared to the solar cycle so every 32 months 16 days and eight gatis which is three hours you have about a one month of lunar cycle extra so you need to adjust every roughly 2.7 years of solar cycle you have to adjust additional months so that's why we see this adik mass coming through uh, every every two and a half years, two point seven years. Um, this year was the the same thing because of the, this Diwali, and we had a, a adik mass in Diwali. But then the question came to why we have those tithis with the gaps in it. So we had, I, I believe, we had the Diwali, and then we had a gap, and then we had the the, the New Year, and the beach by beach is on the same day, so for so on. So why we have that one? So, so based on what we talked about last time, and I went a little more and looked for it, the, 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 the moon orbits around the sun in elliptical fashion. So you have, the unlike sunrise and sunset, which is about 24 hours, moon cycle varies between 19 hours to 26 hours. Now, anytime when the sun rises, at the time of the sunrise, the TT, TT would be, so, so, so let's say moon has, moon, moon cycle starts, let's say 5.30 in the morning and sunrise, and that was my, my supposed to be my beach. So if the, my beach is supposed to be starting at 5.30 and my sunrise is after that, 5.35, 5.38, at the time of the sunrise, whichever TT has started, the entire day is called that TT, okay? Now, there will be a time where the TT will start after the sunrise. In that case, that day will be a blank day. So you will have a sun, they will have a moon will be rising after the sun will be rising. In that case, you will have a, a, you will have a, a blank day. And same thing, you may have a complete, uh, you have started the uh, sun, 
moon ride earlier than sunrise so let's say you have beach uh, is on in the morning but then in the afternoon you may have a teach started and finished before the next sunrise so that's why you have two tithis because of the hours between those things. So um, your 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 beach was already started uh, eight hours before the sunrise, but then your entire tij is also going to be in the same day before the next sunrise. So in that one particular day, you will have beach and tij tij at the same uh, day of the sun. Um, so that was one of the question I think we had uh, last week that I could not had a full detail on it i had a uh, uh, some guess on it because of this duration of this uh, the moon cycle is about 19 to 28 26 hours a day compared to 24 and how does this tt comes and how does we have a blank day so i don't know if that answers some of the questions i think uh, nikhil had one question maybe me here we talk about a little bit but uh, i don't know if this answers the question what we had last week Yeah, I think, it, uh, I mean, it does. Yeah, you, you mentioned about the, the timing difference, and I think now this is much more clear about when it, uh, when the moon starts and uh, or the moon sets and sun, sun rises. So. Right. So the, the key is that the TT has to be started before the sun rise. And, and so if the TT has already started, that's the TT will be called for the entire day of that sun, sun cycle. Like today's Wednesday. Uh, our the moon cycle has already started let's say two o'clock in the morning so entire day is going to be considered that uh, and if for the at the time of the next sunrise whichever tt is already started that tt will be called the next day however if the second tt is so short timeline that it finishes before the next sunrise then the next day will be blank got it <clears throat> so <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so we talked about uh, we're not going to go over meditation because we've done it a, a bunch already. But what we haven't discussed is uh, meditating at work. So I'd like to give you some tips and tricks for bringing that mindfulness and meditation into work. Okay, so the first one is to use an app. Uh, there are many apps you can do as far as meditation and it's as simple as touching a button and you can do it for two minutes. You can do it for three minutes. You can set a, set a time. You can do it for 10 minutes if you have that. So be, it's really recommended because it will allow you to work on your own time. So you can use a meditation app and you don't have to close your eyes. You know, you don't have to think people are, people don't have to think you're sleeping at work or anything like that. You can leave your eyes open. And you can use that app to get you uh, that increase in attention that you want. Um, before jumping into your next task, take five minutes to count your breath. You can do that if you don't have the app. Um, uh, before you start a task, allow yourself to focus on the present by just being still and monitoring all the sounds and sensations around you and monitoring how your body feels sitting in your chair. Uh, be mindful during lunch. So if you remember, we did an eating meditation. You can do that every day. Every day when you're at work and you have lunch, you can do eating meditation. This is kind of crazy. Um, after we did that, maybe it was like a year ago, we practiced an eating meditation where we had an apple and we practiced meditating while eating, experiencing that apple. I have since done eating meditation at every meal after I learned about that you could do it. And I love it. Um, uh, I never get that feeling where uh, I'm hungry after I ate because I wasn't paying attention to what I was eating. And now it's, it's gone so far. I've gotten, I've gotten so used to it that I don't like eating with people anymore. Because they're distracting my experience. Their, their conversation is intruding on my meal. <laughs> so I kind of went overboard, but I love it. If this is a chance for you to uh, really, really practice paying attention, increasing the quality of your attention to increase the quality of your life. What's, what's the eating meditation? Is there a two-sentence summary? Oh, sure, yeah. So the eating meditation is to not 
be distracted by what you're eating. You focus on what you're eating with all of your senses, not just your taste. You focus on how your food looks. You focus on how it smells, how it feels in your mouth, obviously how it tastes, um, how sound is less obvious, but you really use, you eat with all of your senses. And I know it's easy to say, oh, other people will distract you, but that's not the issue. You will distract yourself while you're eating not only it's even it's even worse than oh eating while watching something obviously don't do that don't eat while listening to something but you will start thinking about other things other than eating right while you're eating you'll start thinking about what do i have to do next after lunch or you'll start thinking about a conversation that you had or some thing that you want to a problem you're trying to work on that is you're not thinking about eating you're thinking about something else so in addition to experiencing all the sensations you try not to be distracted by other things that is eating meditation and so i do that all the time now and i love it uh so i recommend that you do that uh so go outside for a walk uh same thing with eating meditation we tried i don't think we maybe tried it we just described it walking meditation walking is the most easiest thing for us to do and get distracted by right we, people love to go on walks and think, go on walks and talk, but they don't really go on walks and experience what it's like to be walking, experience what it's like to put one foot in front of the other, experience what it's like to swing your hands while you're walking. The same thing where eating meditation is just paying attention to eating, walking meditation is paying attention to walking. Uh, so mantras, who can tell me why mantras work? We've gone on over it many times, so I'm going to be relying on you. Are mantras magic? Or how do mantras work? Or do they not work? Who can tell me? I think it definitely work. After our discussion about picking up a mantra and using that, uh, the one I've, I've used is uh, the Kame Misava GV. Mm -hmm. Because what I've, I've, I've felt is after I had a, you know, a perceived uh, discussion or dialogue with somebody that I don't feel good about, I I practice that mantra. Oh, that's I great. Mean, it's definitely, I mean, it gets me out of it. I mean, sometimes, you know, I'm winding down, I can't get the thoughts out of my mind. I practice that and that helps. I mean, I say it and that helps me to, to, to come out of it. Uh, and I've seen, actually, I, in the middle, I, f I forgot that uh, a little bit. And then it wasn't uh, helping me. So uh, I'm trying to pick it back up, but it's, it's been really helpful. That's great. Um, that's a perfect way to do that. That's a perfect way to apply the mantra, that you're doing everything exactly right. Remember, mantras work. Mantra is a repetition of a simple phrase that you do in the morning, preferably, or maybe once throughout the day. Mantras work, and mantras are not magic. They don't magically work because of some thoughts that you have and are putting into the universe. Mantras work because of mindfulness. So example, for example, if my mantra is, I want to get more clients for my job, and every day I tell myself that five times, that is in the front of my mind. So that means when it's time for me to go home, I say, hey, no, I'd rather go to that meet and greet because rather than go home, because that's in the front of my mind. Or when it's time for me to call somebody back that I don't want to call back, I say, Hey, I have to call them back because that's at the front of my mind. Okay, so mantras work and they're not magic and you can use a mantra at work. Um, let's see. Any questions or comments about anything we talked about today, whether it's teaching your kids to pay attention, um, paying attention yourself, why the quality of your attention determines the quality of your life, Anything about the sun or the moon or anything about meditating at work and bringing meditation into the workspace? We talked about a lot today. Timir, I want to add about meditating at work. Uh, I just, I, I think I've shared this example here in the class in Saudi. Uh, there was an office uh, a partner. We shared office. And, you know, he was a Muslim and he, he would take the you know, I, I'd see that, you know, sometimes he'll pull out a Naukarwadi. I call it Naukarwadi. They have something like that. And he'll pull it out and, and do it uh, very quickly. And I sometimes I know that he had a hard conversation on the phone. Uh, and then he would he would use it. And I never thought about it 
if if having some sort of because sometimes you know uh, I have like for example phone. Uh, what happens is if I'm trying to do something on a meditation on phone, it can um, uh, kind of I can get distracted and go to Facebook rather than going to that that app. Right. Whereas I think I'm going to try this keeping this Nokawari close by. And uh, even though I think it will remind me of two things, it will be a visual. Plus, my mind will be, you know, my body and mind both will be active, and I kind of know uh, what I'm trying to do. So, I, I think that would be something else I would consider as uh, meditating at work for kind of refocusing, paying attention, and at the same time, uh, you know, accomplishing uh, kind of being, being attentive. That's great. I like that idea of having something physical that you could do because you can look and you can see it. And when you look at it, it reminds you of what you want to do. It's like a post-it note, right? It's like the same thing like a post-it note that says focus, you know, like you look at that and you're like, oh, it brings you in. It brings you it brings your mind to what you want to do. And we've all had an experience like that. The one you described, like I've recently had experience where I wanted to send an email. So I logged into my email and then I was distracted by the inbox because the inbox is just there, right? So I was doing that and it was like 10 minutes later and I still hadn't sent the email, the one thing I wanted to do when I opened the app, right? So we all have those kind of experiences. So other questions or comments about anything we talked about today? Well, one, one last thing. Uh, go ahead, Shetha. Uh, sorry, I was going to say with the no car, it's, it's like an adult fidget spinner. <laughs> or, a, or a fidget cube and I, and I think that's why those things actually work for kids and uh, I forget who asked the question earlier about people with ADD or ADHD is these tricks whether it's uh, no carvari or fidget spinner or a mantra something these occupy the conscious stream of or, or maybe a subconscious uh, you know, fact check that later but it occupies that stream that gets distracted a lot so that you're, you can focus on your thoughts or you can focus on uh, um, other other things. So it's uh, one thing I'm going like, to think about is what are the other fidget spinners and habits that I can, uh, I can incorporate in, uh, in, in my day-to-day. -day. So I was just going to say that, and since, since I have the mic... Uh, one one game that I play at cocktail parties when when we're starting this conversation and I'm meeting somebody new is to see how long I can go in the conversation without asking the other person. Uh, so what do you do? Right? Because that seems like a just a automatic cop out um, easy approach uh, to have that conversation. So I see can I have a conversation with somebody I've never met before? without asking about uh, where they, what they do for work. Um, and that helps me become more attentive in what they're actually saying and being interested in them um, as, as, a, as a person. Great idea. Yeah, that's a great idea. Uh, what I was gonna say is, uh, the, the to-do list, what you talk about, we all make that, most of us will make that in the workplace. We do that, and it's pretty successful. The challenge to do that at home, make sure when you do it, it's aligned with your other family member's to-do list. Uh, <laughs> if you're not making that one on your own, uh, make sure you your list is part of uh, your family people, whoever, your kids, your wife, your uh, family who are making the list uh, for the day. So typically what we see that during the holidays, uh, weekends, uh, here's a list comes and then everybody starts following it. Well, if you don't make your list on that list, then obviously you will not have your priorities addressed. So make sure, and that's, that's exactly what, what we do. Uh, Shetu, you mentioned something about the breakfast time. That's exactly the time we have the, the family get together and have a to-do list for the rest of the weekend, rest of the holidays, whatever it is, to identify those things from everybody's perspective. Um, so that we can reprioritize. It's not just only my priority, but it's a family priority that we need to follow through. So we do do that one, and that is pretty pretty successful. And second thing, I do want to ask Timir if you can share some of those apps you were talking about for meditation, um, if it's available to share. If you don't mind, just post them over 
Sure. The most popular ones, I've used Headspace. I like it a lot. I've used um, um, Calm. I like that one. Uh, it's I like that one less than Headspace. I've used, there's an app that Sam, this guy Sam Harris has. That is less about meditation and more about learning. Uh, I like that one. And they all have free versions and you can try sure. those. So it's called Waking Up, um, and it's by this guy, Sam Harris. Uh, and so, so yeah, those three, Headspace, Calm, and Waking Up, you can try those three. And they all have three okay. versions you can try uh, to see if it's to your liking. All right. Thank you. And that's a great point that you made. And to somebody who's not, who's new at this, who's just coming at this from, uh, hey, I just go with the flow every weekend, it might sound crazy, uh, and it might sound like a lot of work. But if you don't do it, you will have your priorities set by someone or something else that's not even from your family, and you won't get anything done. Uh, it is, to, in order to get something done, as we get older, in order to get something done, if it's not on the list or if it's not on the priority, it's not happening because there are a million things that, that like, I got to take out the trash, I got to fix the car, I got to get my oil changed, I got to do this. And so if it's something like, Oh, I need to spend a little time talking with my daughter about this. If it's not on there, like there's a million other things I could be that we have responsibilities for, right? So it's not crazy. It sounds crazy if you're uninitiated to this. Let's have a scrum in the morning with the family and go over what everybody has to do. It sounds crazy. It sounds like you're making your real life, your work life, but it's what you need to do to get anything done. Thank you, everybody, for your time this week. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thanks. Have a great Thank week. You.